Okay, and we're going live. Okay. So, hopefully, everybody can hear us on YouTube. Um, hello. Yes. <laughs> hello. This is, uh, wait, I have to introduce, I have to, okay, hello. And we have some new people coming in. Um, welcome to the last session of the By Design uh, series, Research by Design, which is moderated by Anna, who is next to me, actually, um, right here. And she, Anna Hashimatelli, um, who is a senior lecturer in design in the product design um, department in, in Abe. And I'm going to let her introduce herself. Um, we are also joined by Stefania and Liam. Stefania is from Liverpool University and Liam is from Squid Soup here in Bristol. And um, Anna is going to moderate the session um, and I'm going to step out of the frame. Thank you, Mara. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Fazimichali and I'm a senior lecturer in design. My background is originally in engineering and I was always doing research between the interface on design and manufacturing. So, in a way, we have art from design and manufacturing, which is science or engineering on the other side. Uh, I quit my career in academia to work in intellectual property, so I trained in law for some weird reason. Yes, and um, now I teach in the product design cluster. So, I would like basically to pass the ball to Stefania now to introduce herself, because today she will be the engineer of the session. Okay, so thank you, thank you, Anna. Um, my name is Stefania Soldini, and I'm from the University of Liverpool. Um, I'm aerospace engineer by training, um, specialized a lot in uh, actually software development for satellite guidance and navigation, but recently had fun with uh, origami solar sails and manufacturing. So it's uh, my first project on, on the topic, and it's, it's been quite an exciting experience. So it is uh, your first actually this is your first origami project yeah first origami robotic project so is the feasibility study is, is, it's been a very good experience for me to try to, to uh, explore new ideas yes very creative as well um so maybe i let liam introduce is, is that right <laughs> yeah that's that's absolutely fine sorry i was just rearranging my windows um <laughs> yeah so uh, my name's liam bertels i am uh, one of the directors of um, Squid Soup, um, and I'll talk more about who, who Squid Soup are and what we do um, when I when I start to talk. Um, but primarily, we we create large scale immersive installations at, at the moment, kind of primarily around sort of LED uh, kind of light artworks and sound and sound kind of works. Um, yeah, my background is is actually furniture and jewellery design, oddly enough, um, very craft based. Um, and then I um, really got into um, 3D computer graphics, particularly I got into generative form. So sort of um, very early days of, um, of Richard Dawkins, if you know who that is, and um, um, sort of a life and um, sort of um, evolving evolutionary sort of um, systems biology. And so, uh, yeah, so I did an MSc in 3D computer graphics. Uh, following that um yeah and then gradually over the years have run all kinds of been involved in all kinds of creative practice um and have been a been a director and creative um force within squid soup for the last 17 years so yeah yeah so i think that's enough so do you consider yourself a craftsman oh no i'm terrible i don't have i'm quite add i i just don't have the level of concentration um I, what I what I what I like and what drives my um, drives my interest in, in in kind of immersion and immersive forms is actually the sort of multi-sensory aspect. So I'm 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 really to me the the kind of proprioceptive, the kind of awareness of where your body is in space is is actually kind of highest in my mind and particularly kind of physical relationships within space your awareness of where other people are is kind of drives me but no not really I wouldn't although I make lots of things yeah and since actually you used the term space even though in a context uh a bit different Stefania is working for space applications 
and okay. yes and she is working let's say on bodies which is sales essentially that have to find their space inside space or they have to unfold inside space right stefania yeah uh, yes so yeah exactly the project is about um origami robotics so I'll, I'll, um, most of the time uh, satellites needs to be as you imagine launched into space in a very compact way but then we need uh, to do some deploy some instruments so origami is quite a way to allow satellite to kind of get operative in space in, in a quite clever manner uh, mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. think about it so it's interesting we... sorry oh. do you have a presentation for today yeah yeah i do yes. uh can i start sharing yes <clears throat> okay okay um you should be able to see my screen and now it's full full view i suppose yes does it look good mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna try to be maybe little technical as possible, but forgive me, I'm an engineer. Sometimes I got into techni technicality. Uh, anyway, the project I'm talking today about is, is titled Origami Solar Say Technology for Next Generational Self-Reconfigurable CubeSat. Now the title is it's quite long, but what it means is um, the, the idea behind this project is about reconfigurability of CubeSat. Uh, this project has been funded by EPSRC through the Connected Everything, where uh, I had the, the chance to meet Anna Emirat, and, uh, and that's why I'm here today. Um, this was uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, partners, external partners, uh, JAXA, which is a Japanese aerospace agency, and Oxford Space System. This is uh, the team, or was the team, because the project is, is finished, unfortunately. Um, so as you can see, there are people from different, uh, from academia, from industry, from space agency, and also collaboration with the, with the, with the University of Glasgow. Now, the idea behind the project started um, because I was thinking about uh, a be inspired approach towards space exploration. So if you think about satellite, they usually are one object going to explore or do, do some sort of uh, analysis, data analysis, or try to take imaging of the Earth. And they usually is one single object. What I was thinking instead, it would be cool if we have, um, let's say, um, a, an approach towards space for example, if we think about Ant Colony, where we have a lot of these maybe micro satellites that work together to explore specific planet or uh, the surface of Mars, uh, they could coordinate, for example, to solve a specific task and finally reconfigure for, uh, for example, to respond to um, situation that otherwise could be difficult to achieve some specific tasks. So the idea here, how, how can we enable this uh, complex uh, uh, approach towards space exploration? Uh, before getting towards something so big as a project, we decided we needed to prove a concept and trying to understand what, what type of technology we need. So the, the biggest challenge for, uh, for space industry is um, how can we have reconfigurable uh, satellite. So usually they are quite fixed in their design. They cannot achieve several tasks once they are designed. That's what the, the tasks they're going to uh, be doing. Um, and also CubeSat haven't been used um, much in space only for Earth application, but it would be interesting to use miniaturized technology to also for deep space exploration because it could we could end up having um uh, saving some cost in the in the design of this mission they have been recently tested in mars application cubesat and uh i think is in, in in the interest of space agency to try to push in using this technology for deep space now why there are the origami involved in this? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, when we launch a, spa a spacecraft in, in, uh, in space, we need to make sure we have a comp compact volume. Then when we want to do some sort of uh, having a, an op a satellite in an op operative manner, we need, for example, to deploy this, the solar panels. 
Uh, and this is the most classical, most used example of origami in space, the simplest example you can think about. But there are also other type of, um, uh, let's say, uh, spacecraft, which are called solar sails. Now, solar sails is quite, is quite uh, um, a recent uh, technology in the sense that uh, has been tested only in 2010 for the first time. And what is uh, fascinating about solar sail is that um, those systems are totally propellant free. So the beauty about using a sail in space is this is a highly reflecting mirror. You can think about in that term. And by reflecting the sunlight, uh, the sail is able to uh, basically move into space without by reflecting in sunlight without the need of any propellant so it's quite an interesting system so the idea has been has been to uh why if we could use it, this type of technology to enable for for example self-reconfiguration what do i mean for this I kind of call it the next generation of solar sails, although <laughs> the, the application is completely different. But what I mean is by changing, for, you can imagine by changing the reflectivity property locally to the sail, we could imagine of changing shape. Instead of having something flat and traveling into space, we could um, act on a single component of the sail to, to reconfigure. So this was the, the basic idea that we wanted to demonstrate with a feasibility study. Now, I don't want to go too much in detail of this slide, how solar sail are made, but what to take on board from this slide is, if you look uh, on the left hand side, this is an example of origami robots uh, developed at, at MIT. Um, as you can see, by in this case, by activating some magnetic forces, they, they trigger the folding. The idea in this project is to have, as you can see here from in this figure, each facet of the origami sail capable um, to change optical properties. So if you have ever seen uh, sunglasses transition lenses, uh, they change uh, depending on how, if they are exposed or not to the sunlight, they, they change op the optical property. Similar, there are devices that can install on solar sail with the same property. And that can trigger the reconfiguration. So how do we want to do this? Or what is the idea? First idea is, for example, if we have a system that allows us uh, to fold and unfold and change shape, what we could do is, first of all, to have, uh, for example, uh, a satellite which act as, um, as a say in a sail configuration, solar sail configuration, for example, to travel from the Earth to another planet. And then we could reconfigure at, and uh, achieve a shape that is similar to a reentry vehicle. So it's, this is very schematic representation, like a pyramid for re-entering on the surface of Mars. So this is kind of the idea behind. And uh, we initially, when we started the idea of, of our feasibility study, explore on really on origami paper, this idea. So how can we print on, uh, on the substrate of the solar sail? Now this is paper, and then I'm gonna show you with some other material. This was, um, um, this idea was to avoid mechani mechanism for deployment. So we used the idea of having um, a structure printed on the sail that act as a, you can imagine as a cartilage uh, that gets activated. And we actually, while doing this experiment, we realized that not only optical property could, are important to trigger configuration, reconfiguration, but also the 4D material. So a combination of both can be used and can enhance the effect of origami reconfiguration. So in one case, for instance, if we look here, we could use the optical control for passing from a flat uh, design to, uh, I don't know, re-entry vehicle, and then the for, for the material to reverse the initial um, configuration. Um, now, this is just to summarize what we did. We did from one side, the manufacturing part. So we try uh, different um, mechanisms and we find out that the cartilage pat pattern is the best 
uh, for foldability and weight. Space in, in space, the weight is very important because the heavier is an object to be launched into space, the, the higher is the cost of, uh, of launching. And on the right hand side, we did some uh, analysis into origami uh, algorithm and also in um, kind of a numerical demonstration of what is going to happen to space. So this is an example animation of what happened when you have different illumination like light blue and gray it means difficult, different optical properties. You can see those panel oscillate and this is kind of the idea behind the project. Uh, this is the, the final count. Uh, what was interesting is that we could figure it out the minimum um, for the material we need to perform uh, the um, the, 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 the unfolding. So the idea was we don't need to actually press for the material everywhere, but only uh, in specific um, zone and edges to trigger this um, deployment. And this is a video, uh, as you can see, basically this material that you see on, on the um, on the on the base of the origami pattern is uh, similar to what solar sail are made of, which is uh, a captain, and one side is uh, aluminized, so it's as because it can ha uh, is very reflective. Um, so you will need to imagine that in each facet we will need to install um, some um, uh, actuator that will change the optical property. Uh, of the sail. In this case, we are um, applying an external heat to trigger the deployment. And this is kind of uh, an example of how we can use for the material to uh, achieve this uh, folding and unfolding. Of, of course, this is a, a lab scale. Uh, you have to imagine, and this is going to be much bigger in space, but is a prototype to understand with what we could achieve uh, with the uh, origami robotic um, and uh, for the material. Uh, to conclude, um, this is kind of our vision. So I, if you remember in the first slide, I mentioned ant colony and the idea of having um, satellite that could um, readapt and reconfigure and work together. So in a bigger scale, you can imagine that uh, the unit we've seen today, so this origami show the video, correspond to one unit that you see display here. And the idea will be to try to figure it out which kind of component we need uh, in terms of uh, uh, self-reconfigurable ob object in order to achieve, for example, uh, different uh, mission phases and increase the flexibility to our space mission. For instance, in the first phase, those objects could configure together and be in a sail mode to travel to a planet. They could, uh, you know, change configuration and act as a relay satellite to map the planet. They could um, reconfigure together and be become, for instance, an active airbag. And then when they land, they just act as a rover on the planet. Like this is kind of a far future, but with the feasibility study, we could demonstrate that at least the reconfigurability is possible and we would like to do more work in this. So this is at the end of my presentation. If, if there is any question, discussion, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Stefania. I think we will save the questions and the discussion for the end. So I will pass it now to Liam. So if can Liam give his presentation. Hello. Hello. Right. Oh, that's me back. Right. So I, I've not got a formal presentation as such. I'm just going to talk through lots of imagery and um, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that we've done um, and talk about kind of how they relate to some of those themes about the, the kind of uh, design of space kind of uh, kind of our, our relationship to space, our relationship to immersion, um, and I'm particularly going to focus on a, a project. I'll kind of draw in towards the end with a focus on a project called Audio Wave, and discuss how that that uh, a kind of um, multiplicity of controllable kind of media objects in space. Um, so away we go. Okay, so um, as I've already said, I'm just going to talk about Squid Soup for a little while. Um, squid Soup are a, um, 
a kind of loose collective of designers, um, creatives, kind of technologists, uh, kind of theatre people, a real mixture of people. Uh, I've come from arts and, and kind of gone into kind of uh, kind of media and media technologies and and you know I've worked in low low end virtual spaces and done collaborative events in virtual spaces. Um, the other the other kind of director came from engineering and then went towards kind of media and we've kind of met in this in this middle space kind of um, creating immersive kind of media landscapes. Um, so um, actually. I, I hope you can all see the website. What you're actually looking at, looking at there. I, what I'll do is I'll go to, I'll go to um, a couple of projects first. So we are most known for our, our. It'll be a little bit slow for our kind of large scale LED volumes. So um, I just, I'm just picking one out of out of a, a hat. I'm hoping that the internet's fast enough. So uh, these are, <coughs> so we we have a, a technology that's, that's actually a fairly standard technology, um, DMX controlled uh, light strings, um, individually addressable lights. If, you, if you're from a theater background, you'll, you'll understand, you'll kind of be able to reference DMX. Um, and then we have written a volumetric um, 3D engine, which, creates real-time particle systems, real-time behaviors in that volume. Um, and we, we, can, can, we can trigger those in real time and perform with those. We can create pre-built sequences against audio tracks. Um, and we can change the shape and size of these volumes. Um, and we've been doing that for quite a long time. This is actually uh, the smallest of the, of the kind of arrangements we do. Um, that's got about 5,000 points of light in it. Um, and, that's actually at Leeds, that one. Um, what we're most known for, and the, 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 the culmination of where that's kind of arrived at is, and I wanna play this, I don't know how loud the sound will be or if you'll hear it at all, but what we're most known for is, is the very large scale versions of that, um, where we perform with a number of, of laptops and a, a number of people triggering events um, um, at uh, four tech gigs, and I'll see whether this will play at the same time. So hopefully you can see that. So we're controlling these lights in real time. Um, Kieran, who is Fortet, is at the center, but the audience is also in, in this light scale, light volume with him, and we are illustrating and drawing over in, in real time. We're drawing, we're putting graphics over, a graphical layer over that kind of shared space. Um, and that was about nine or 10,000 people in, in that space. So I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> um, so that's kind of one of the things we've become known for. Um, our objectives are always to create new and interesting experiences. In that case, it was to kind of try and flatten the relationship between the performer and the audience. So to change the kind of social dynamic in space um, using kind of um, using light to, to manipulate how you felt about the space. Um, we're interested primarily in kind of collaborative experiences, but immersive experiences that are shared. So, that, so with, with kind of virtual, immersive experiences the computer is the computer screens dropped in front of you and you are you are it's immediately mediating between you and other people in the space but in this case what we're trying to do is put people in an immersive space where the computer doesn't mediate your your interactions um, and if you do any reading about the early days of um, kind of video conferencing technology although we're now all familiar with video conferencing technology, the screen is a really complex, creates a really complex dialogue between people when they're talking space to face to face. Um, all that's changing, obviously. Um, so that's kind of our base, that's our kind of baseline. That's, that's kind of the technology that we've arrived at and become known for over the last decade. Um, but it's a technology that that imposes a digital layer on space and what we became interested in was the idea that um we could we could partly we could do the same with sound we could create we could create um soundscapes which are similarly shared so if you 
Um, so I'll show you, I'll, I'll jump to a project and then I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, I will, so where, where, where will we start? Uh, I'm just going to start with, so you can see we've done quite a lot of stuff with the LED volumes. I am just going, uh, maybe I'm in the wrong, uh, let me just go with bespoke commissions. Okay, and then, oh no, I was in the right place. Ah, I'm gonna go with wave. I'll go back and show you the roots of this if we've got time. Um, you may need to warn me if I, I tend to talk quite a lot and we'll carry on for quite a long time. So I'm just going to play a little bit of this video. So this, this looks very similar. It's, it's lights in space, but actually each one of these lights is also a speaker, but it's also a little mini IoT computer. So in this case, there's about 600 lights, if you can see my screen, there's about 600 little computers. And that image is actually Burning Man. So we set this up in a, in, in a desert and it's running off a generator in, in, in about 45 degrees heat. Um, and this was a, so, so it's a real world test for technology. It's, it's, it was, we were really pushing at the, at the boundaries of the technology. Each one of those devices, and I will show you on my screen. So that is one of those light units. Now, in this case, they were enclosed. They didn't. The speakers were um, contact speakers that make it vibrate. But but this is the, the the updated unit, which has a little mini three watt speaker in the bottom. And if I open it up, which I'm hoping I can do, yeah, there we go. Uh, I will just give me a minute. I'll just get it out. I will pull it off. So you got the, you got this. I'm hoping that you can see, can you see the speakers inside on a little uh, rapid prototype mount? And then inside is a little board with 14 LEDs, um, a 16 gigabyte memory card. On the back, which you can't quite see, is, is what's called an ESP32, which is, um, it's kind of it's kind of like an Arduino, only a, a bit more powerful. Um, it's got an accelerometer in it um, and a sound card on it. Um, and in the case of the project that you're looking at on the screen there, there's about 600 of those things in the desert. They run on 12 volts. So we're running 12 volts down the cable. Um, and together they create this, this immersive soundscape in the space. So I'll just play a couple of seconds of this. I think I'm interviewed on this and I hate the sound of myself. On a, I hate listening to myself. That's actually it being shown at Canal Convergence. So, um, this technology um, is is so we've moved from a technology where we're we're doing top down programming and we're programming as though it was traditional media to looking at an experience which not only creates um, a sound and light experience in the way that we would 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 uh, an immersive sound experience an immersive multi-point sound experience um, that's shared but also different for everyone um, creating that experience um, from emergent behaviors in hundreds of these devices um, and What's progressed over the time and why this input, this project, although it looks in some ways similar to the kind of stuff we've done, why it's conceptually very different from an artistic perspective and, and, and from a, a concept is that, that we are firing onto a wireless network, an event, and we're not actually, fire, we're not telling each individual thing what to do. We're, we're, we're sending an event which says, there is an event that's coming, you are, in response to that event, do a behavior. And so we've moved from things where we're, we've created kind of visual graphics into things which are led by emergent behaviors and creating emergent behaviors in mediascapes. And so, um, and actually in order to make decisions about how they behave, they've got very little information. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's just to randomly blink. And what you get is an on a, on a probability. 
sometimes it's do something in relationship to basically there's only two properties you can really play with and it's time and, and time and location so it's it's you use those your position in space and your and and the time that the event gets to you to generate a whole set of events and it's amazing how many kind of how many um properties visuals graphical graphical kind of things unfold from that in terms of in terms of the visuals um we're now at the point where we are um i'll go to twitter we're beginning to take this so it started out as a as a kind of um as an artwork where it was static so we're loading sound files onto this and we're we're sending a sequence of events which play as a narrative structure to now some of you will have seen where we're actually trying to do live performances with this rig so in this case this is a collaboration with roxana vilk um we've just done a test at the trinity center so we've got live musicians playing and we're sending events live into the rig and we're trying to begin to kind of imagine new kinds of spaces uh, and i think what you can begin to think about is all the interesting ways you can then begin to kind of reimagine kind of public spaces, public sonic spaces. Um, it's a real change in the way we're thinking. Now, I've got a whole load more stuff that I can talk about um, in terms of this, but maybe we talk about it as as you ask me questions. There's a couple of things that um, that yeah maybe we, we we talk about those things in relationship to questions. Let me just check my notes and see whether there's anything in here that I thought yeah that might be useful to say yeah. And layers of space yeah no I think that's it. So I think well I'll leave the next bits and I can show you more imagery against kind of a, a set of questions and a discussion. I think that will be brilliant. Uh, cool. yeah, thank you very much. I actually remember I was in the Southwest Creative Technology Showcase probably a couple of years ago yeah. where you demonstrated the first prototypes. Yeah. It was just a couple of them. And with all prototypes, they were the people were when I was walking in, they couldn't make them do what they were supposed to do in yeah. the demonstration. And I'm amazed how how this scaled up so fast, actually. And I think this is the beauty of distributed systems and of collective intelligence, right? So if you manage to get one right, then yeah. you can replicate that. So yeah, yeah. I mean, how we've, easy we've was that? Uh, pardon? How easy was it to replicate? Um, it, uh, yeah, we're on iteration number four now, I think. Uh, we The soft software system's been rewritten three times mm -hmm. <laughs> from the ground up. Uh, because each time you do stuff, you you kind of go, you, you discover new things that you want. Yes. Um, and so you kind of evolve stuff. Um, it's one of the interesting things that we, we, we so it, it's one of the interesting things in, in coming at something with an, as an artist, one of the focuses that it gives you is you have an idea of the artwork that you want to produce. So we're making a tool set against, we're always making tool sets against the kinds of artworks that we want to produce, the kinds of things we want to say. And that actually gives it a tremendous focus. The difficulty with that is that you end up often rewriting things repeatedly. Mm -hmm. But the coming at it from the other way, and having been an academic as well, I've seen this happen a lot, is people try and make the ideal tool set. And in trying to make the ideal tool set, it's never finished. So it never gets to market because they're continually adding their ideal tool set of features mm -hmm. rather than this set of features is the features we need to make this thing happen. So yes, complex in getting there and a lot of work and a lot of money, yes. a lot of money to make it work. Yeah, yeah. Just and, to bring uh, Stefania as well into the discussion, I think that Stefania is now at the early stages of trying to scale up the technology trying to make the single item work and once this is working then this can replicate itself and i'm wondering if she can comment on that yep well i don't know how how fast i <laughs> i can do that uh, scale up because as mentioned it's 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 easy to say than to do it um they think the let's say the the challenges of our project will be to make sure we use material that are uh, 
compatible for for the space environment and so so far what we have used are material for a common uh, 3d printer which definitely doesn't uh, they're not um, certified for space application so what i mean for that is like the extreme temperature condition um rather than the effect of radiation so definitely that's what would be a big challenge for us um try to use those uh, those application for you know they can survive this this space environment that was one of my questions actually that i was going to ask you was that you'd done heat activated and one of the things that I know about space is it's very, very cold. That, that's, well, it depends. <laughs> if you are in shade, it's very cold. If you are in the sun, it's very hot. Ah, so right. you, you, have, um, you have this extreme temperature going on. And that's a very good, good question because for the, for the material, then we, we have to use uh, activation, activation temperature that are either compatible to the environment we, we encounter so that's quite challenges as well oh well, that's but that leads to some really interesting design challenges because you could create something that's self-shading so in fact it's like a you you could create something sorry I'm, my brain just goes into <laughs> creative mode you could create something that that actually that starts a process and shades itself continually more exponentially as it as it folds in so it so it gets cooler and cooler and cooler so so you only have to put a little bit of energy in at the front just to tip tip the balance over. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I understand. Um, I think that one of the way they, they use to dissipate temperature in space is, um, uh, you know, because there is no air. So that's the problem with, with space. We need to use uh, like a, a radiator yeah, <laughs> to yeah. kind of get rid of it. Um, so it, that's, that's, but in fact, for instance, a passive way usually to control temperature, just change using different color of paint. Uh, so you will right, see that okay. the, 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 the color of paint of a satellite actually has a meaning. It's not just for okay, uh, aesthetic, so but it's also for temperature. But that's interesting because you could then use electrically activated pigment to change. Possibly, that could be very, yeah, yeah, very you interesting. Yeah, you the color. Of, you change the color of the surface as a and and really reduce the. Uh, yeah, yeah, that 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 that's could be very very cool idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder, William, if you also had similar uh, challenges with material because oh, Stefania is yes. working on space, so the material that had to go on space are obviously not our daily objects. What? Well, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think um, we looked at Burning Man, which is I've got my screen shared there. So um, I don't know whether there's any pictures of dust clouds. So we we so biggest challenges in the UK are keeping things waterproof. Yeah. Okay. So plastic fine. You so these are these little connectors on the top, aircraft connectors. Um, we we spent quite a lot of time doing something. Oh, what's that? there you go basically just working out how to get that screwed in properly mm -hmm. make sure that we've got a nice compression fitting and the temptation with nearly every everybody because it's what you grow up seeing is to kind of stick silicon round stuff stick silicon gels put glue in stuff and just kind of go right i'll really make it it seal nicely but the problem you've got is expansion and contraction you've got you've got all these little variables which actually mean that the best thing to do is to rather bravely put a little rub you probably can't see it oh where am i there but there's a little rubber grommet in that and just to put it under compression and you kind of go mm, it that's not going to stop the water in but that's the most effective waterproofing so basically we have to and this is not something you can do in space. We have to allow for things to break and we just have to factor in that into, into what we do. Yeah. Now, you'd think, you'd think that water, you'd think you'd go, well, if water, water can get in, but dust won't get in. But Burning Man, it's like camping in a bag of cement. It's, it's, it's just very, very, very fine dust and it gets into the balls believe it or not, even when they're sealed around the bottom. So yeah, lots of lots of manufacturing challenges. I mean, putting stuff in 45 degrees temperature, we, you know, the balls all come back yellow because they're just the sunlight degradation. There is, you know, things like the, the rapid prototyping elements. You, you just, you, you, there's delamination on threads. It's just a whole set of challenges that you kind of have to Come, I, I suppose when you asked me earlier, was I a kind of craft person? Kind of, because actually we don't try and 
we try to engineer stuff out, but actually the way we engineer stuff is by making lots of prototypes mm -hmm. and testing and just physically testing stuff yeah. and, and then seeing what gives first and then make some more because quite often a lot of the stuff that you've got is really unpredictable. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm wondering how you would do that in space. Is there a way of, of prototyping in that way for space? But basically, I mean, there are, um, let's say, way in which you can test how objects will behave into space. But um, like, for instance, you, you have this type of uh, oven where you can test the temperature cycle or you there is also a vacuum condition there is some some testing you can do before definitely you have to do them before yeah. launching anything in space but in fact that's kind of the the issue if you want about space application is uh, there is a, cons a conservative approach towards design so often mm, satellites are designed by using uh, technology they have high uh, rtl so that they have been already proved in space have already flown and so usually it, it costs less to space agency to use I would, I would call it older technologies. Um, and that's why I, I wanted to do a project about miniaturized satellite CubeSat because they are cheaper to develop. And yeah. so if we think about changing the way in which mission are designed, instead of having this huge monolithic satellite going towards a smaller scale, and maybe we have the opportunity to even fly newer technology because the risk of losing one of those units is so small that we can afford to launch many of them and do you think that's going to change with 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 the light with, with with the fact that we're just getting more and more things fired into space do you think that's going to become a, a an exponential process that evolves i mean yeah it's, it's possible it's possible uh because in the for earth application we have already uh like CubeSat have been already launched a lot and yeah. actually astronomer, if you have read the news, are not very happy about having so many objects fly into space because it ruined the dark, the dark sky. Um, so a balance is needed for sure uh, between um, how many objects we create in space, making sure we don't create space junk and make, you know, make, make sure that it's gonna be a sustainable process. So that's probably the, the biggest challenge if we go towards that, that's that approach, um, try to, to keep preserving our space environment and not leaving uh, too many man-made satellites <laughs> dismissed yeah. in, in space, yeah. because that is one problem. Yeah. I, I think both, looking at both projects, I believe that you both try to build in some kind of contingency in the whole design. So if one breaks, it wouldn't have an impact, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, but also, this is one one element of that. And the other is, as Liam said, that one of those elements might decide to do something else, might decide to blink, right? They yeah. have their own character. Uh, is this correct? Uh, what are you talking to me specifically? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think I think the and that's always the balance. The balance you you have to kind of strike is is the fact that you want a you want a visual effect, but mm -hmm. but allowing effects to emerge. And and actually, what you begin to realize is that as you create more, as you put multiplicities of things into space, is that like looking at a murmuration in the sky. Hence, the work we've got works called murmuration. Actually. Um, there are birds within that murmuration doing things that they're not supposed to or falling out of the sky or whatever. But what the brain looks at, what the eye looks at is actually the, 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 the behavior as a whole. And that's just a function of the way we, the way we assess what's going on. Um, and you can use that. You can use that to an advantage where I, I don't quite know how it applies in terms of the, the physical output, but we we've used that. And we, we were really worried at the start that people would really notice individual things going wrong but quite often people are kind of walk up and go oh well this one's oh look it's you know it's 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 doing something different or oh, maybe it's been told to do something different well actually it's just continually crashing it's what it's doing it's just continually breaking and restarting itself um yes yeah, so lots of contingency but also just gradually learning that the behaviors you can you can it's just simple stuff like like learning how how to 
do start up and shut down behaviors in such a way that that they're you know they don't make horrible noises or that they you know they they, they it, it often it's the it's the kind of lead in and the lead out tail that you you kind of where all the subtlety is what they do when they're supposed to be doing their thing is yeah, yeah that's fine but it's it's yeah and i would i would suspect it's the same with with the with the space stuff i would suspect it's the same with the space sales actually there's a lot of effort in just getting them to go right and now i'm ready is everybody ready yes everybody's ready we're all going to do stuff now okay i'm going to do stuff now because that's one of the questions another question i had for you actually was about the change in the center of mass in terms of multiplicities of sales i thought that would be really quite interesting because because with a sail that goes in and out along an arm, that mass, that center point, they've got control of the mass going in and out. And, and you could see that there'd be a spinning motion like a ballet dancer when they pull in their arms, which they'd have to counteract. But with you, with your system, if they're all kind of closing up together, there's a, that, yeah, I was quite interested to see how you, where, what, you know, working out those sorts of problems. Yeah, well, I've, we haven't arrived to that point looking to the swarm formation of multiple uh, objects, but we, in one of the numerical study for folding, we are definitely looking into like treating the problem as multi-body masses. So each oh, facet okay. is like a mass, uh, but kind of rigidly connected. So each, the, 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 the kinematic behind is really looking into multi-body dynamics. Now, as a part of a swarm, we haven't looked into that, but it would be more like probably um, kind of relative dynamics between object and how to then decide how to, they attach together. So all that aspect hasn't been explored yet. Yeah, this, I, I think that's where, you, where the, there could be some interesting connections between what, what we've done is it, it's just in things, what happens when things go wrong? What happens if one just goes goes wrong? How, what does it do? Does it fire itself Exam away? Has yeah, it got a protection that's, that's behavior? That's a very good, it... good question. Yeah, and it will be, a lot, that's why I said this, scaling up is going to be challenging because we, we can't really go into space and try. So we have to do all numerical simulation to try to, to expect what is going to happen. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, before coming towards testing that into space, uh, I think we need to be sure we can predict what is going to happen and maybe start with a small, um, like, testing on ground and see if there are, there are some opportunity for, for launch, even for a small project. So probably that would be the way to go. Um, but it, it's it's... Yeah, it's very challenging. Yeah, and is that going to affect? Because because for us, one of the reasons we, I mean, so this this if I'm just we'll, we'll just focus on this one because in terms of this design, actually, although you were saying you were quite conservative, the the the, the, the science is quite conservative. These balls we haven't designed from the ground up. We, these are these are a generic light fitting that we have modified because we know that that works. So the um, and we've modified the suspension method and we've modified the, the 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 how the fittings all work and we've done that because for this for the same reason for, the, for exactly the same reasons that you've said uh, you know we we can go back and redesign it and we are in the process of going back and redesigning it again but the there is there is and I wondered if in terms of going into space is that actually taking a kit of parts in there or almost taking a kit of parts. You know, launching a kit of parts, almost something that's that's reconfigurable, that can reconfigure itself to test a whole number of different scenarios rather than just, you know, it, it, it's got a number of sales that it can try in different ways. It's got a number. Of, so, so rather than sending something that's the complete item, send something that's just, you know, like a tester kit. It just goes up there and goes, right, I'm going to try this out. Oh, no, that doesn't work. That would I'm going to try really that out. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really cool hopefully, yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully just... in the far future yeah yeah <laughs> you're no, not gonna I get know, know, an opportunity I know. I know I'm I'm probably utterly unrealistic no no but the cool things I was thinking about is uh, for instance international space station they do have a 3d printer on board oh wow um and they are testing um you know try to print in microgravity and see what happens so um, I mean, maybe it's not so far-fetched to, 
to in the future to try to instead of uh, even apply for launches maybe in the future you can just uh, you know upload on the international space station like a cad and just print the object you have designed on ground that oh, my brain's my brain's going well can you <laughs> could you spin resin a resin in space so that you don't need a tank you spin resin and fire fire light into it to do so so do a do a resin process well if you like that you should really look into what they have tried to manufacture in space they have done uh, i think some sort of a, the perfect crystal or the perfect oh, shape lovely. because in, micro, in microgravity they managed to to achieve perfection I have looked at the crystal in. thing. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about it. Yeah, cool. that's so cool. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, de I definitely will have a look now. That sounds really good. I actually have uh, a question because so far we talked about a lot about the engineering elements, the consistency, the intelligence behind the system. What about the artistic element? And I know that uh, for Stefania, origami used to be uh, an art, right? And then it got adapted into robotics, into space, probably soon. So how how do you feel about that? Because in, in Liam's work, the element of art is clear. This is part of an ex artistic expression. What about your work? I mean, I'm a drawing engineer, but <laughs> but I think it really the I mean, I've been living in Japan, so definitely I got influenced by the origami art and um, um, what I like about using, the, not only using the origami art, but also the, is, is basically the be inspired approach towards engineering. I think it's fascinating because if you think also nature is beautiful, mm -hmm. like some, some, the way in which some configuration, some leaf uh, fold and unfold like origami, it seems like nature knows about art and perfection. Mm -hmm. or imperfection that look perfect um and and that's what is fascinating i think is make being able to uh, achieve like this kind of a, or large space structure from something that is maybe manufacturing 2d so i, fa I find it fascinating that you can reach a 3d object from simply something that you might have just you know manufacturing in two dimensions so yeah. It's a I don't know here in the future, uh, for instance, if we think about it, the plan is to try to uh, send again human uh, to the moon, so try to construct uh, habitat on the moon, or uh, even uh, uh, we mentioned the International Space Station. We definitely, I think, uh, manufacturing in space will probably require also some sort in the future, some sort of art in in. in in that because mm. if we really want to give the humans a nice experience of being in a such ash environment probably some also it's a aspect of aesthetic it could be applied yeah. now of course he has to be robust <laughs> so probably redundancy will make things look ugly um but um yeah that's 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 why I found it fascinating it, it, solar sail then are very beautiful for me the idea that you can um, move into space without using propellant. It sounds so eco-friendly as well. Um, so I'm really fascinated by the, the property of those material, just by reflecting light, be able to move into space. And and for me, that's it's maybe in, it's engineering, of course, but it's also a form of art, if you want. Of course, yes. And what about you, Liam? At what percent kind of this started as, a, as an expression? What, how, did it start as an art form or did it start as an engineering need or as a market need? Oh, for me, uh, things always start as there's some invisible hand pushing on my back saying, make, get involved in making stuff. Uh, it, to me, it always starts as, as I think, you've got to be quite careful with the discussions of, art, of, of artistic practice I, I, and, and aesthetics, I think, in, 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 the, in this sense. Um, but from my my perspective, um, uh, the work that I do is 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 intended to be um, artistic, an artistic experience. Whether whether I would call myself an artist, um, I, I happen to be involved in making things which which 
sit within the broad frame of what art is. I'm really quite cagey about the, all of this, this terminology and language because actually there's, you know, there's engineering, there's, there's design, you know, and I consider design and art to be different things, um, you know, and I consider sort of um, design might contain art and art might contain design, but actually they're conceptually quite different. Um, and I think science, uh, you know, for me, for me um, what the the starting point is always uh, the sense of an experience. So it's about the human. It's about the human experience. Uh, I think I think the thing that we're describing about space structures, about about opening sails. If the starting point had been we want to put a beautiful object in space that people stare up at the night sky in wonder as they see the sunlight reflected onto points in uh, onto their their landscape, I'd have gone right. That's art. But actually. It's engineering. Now, I utterly agree. I, I sat there going, well, actually, I would make, you know, make the sales do stuff. And that's that's what will happen because the, they're, they're always, you know, even designer rocket ships is 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 influenced by by, you know, what people saw in books as a kid, you know, the Jules Verne drawings or whatever we, you know, Jules Verne, the illustrations in and those sorts of things, you know, um, there's always art in it. You can't you can't get away from it. And there's always human kind of um, human emotion and aesthetic. Where, where there is, I I can think of very little pure engineering that's that's that that exists that exists entirely independent of the tastes and mores of the of the engineer that 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 creates it of the of the you know it it. it it's just human nature because otherwise why would they be doing stuff they're doing stuff because they're putting stuff out into the world everybody is doing that yes. you know whether you're an engineer or whether you're an artist or whatever you are you're creating stuff and putting it into the world because you believe it's it needs to be in the world and you believe that your vision and your 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 way of looking at things is 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 the way to do it and you know and i haven't met anybody who isn't like that isn't like that. They might, they might, yeah, they might, they might have a lot more objectivity. Some people might have more objectivity, but generally everybody is as has has got some sense of ego in terms of the the sense of their purpose of things. So for me, what we do is 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 what Squid Soup do is is comes from uh, from from a very art from an artistic place. Though many people would argue, you know, it, that that it, that you know that would argue about the nature of it as art. Yes, and I think in a way, everything everybody's doing is coming from inside. So yeah. it's, it's a piece of self-expression. And I think it's yeah. similar to Stefania. What she's building is a piece of a vision, essentially, which is her own vision of the future in space. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And I think, I think just to bring uh, Murat into the discussion, who, <laughs> who is... Uh, trained in architecture, architecture is this soup, essentially, of yeah. art, design, engineering, of everything, which connects the dogs or tries to connect the dogs together. Are you, are you really bringing it? Yes, I'm bringing you in. Because I think this is a very interesting point where you, we can wrap up the discussion. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I hate to ruin the session. It's been awesome. Um, I, I think there we've come to this point where um, that pathway is not like that distinction between science and art has become blurred again, almost Da Vinci like yeah. where you can be artsy and trying to tinker. Um, and I, I was telling actually I was telling um my dad uh, hopefully if he hears this session he'll wake up um but uh, i was telling my dad and he he works actually with solar wind um and i was telling him that we're bringing uh an artist that is using the same inform stuff that um stefania who is using solar sails same concept same distributed systems and he was saying it's very interesting that the art because of the um, absence of 
the things that we're saying or not the same things let me let me phrase it the, the, way he phrased the, it. the absence of, of functional need to some degree uh, yeah. it, it function expressed as it must have a purpose yeah it's the absence of 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 the need for purpose exactly because in space the problem we don't know the problem the problem that like in architecture you have gravity right you have sun that you know it's not gonna fry you so you're not in you know you don't have radiation that if you step outside you're gonna turn into you know nothing um so the, there are problems in order to solve them we need to have a repertoire of solutions to to test from and so art now because it's moving into technology it's actually creating this repertoire that we can then look at and and change our perspective um but yeah yes and in and, and, and i think what's important about that is it can do it in quite a free way without 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 some of the baggage of disciplines i mean i i, I that 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 i i think the common in in having taught across sort of computer science um design and arts practice having taught and, and actually also in sort of media practice as well so sort of in sort of um, so taught across a whole set of different disciplines what they all have in common from a student's perspective from a and from a from a an artist and from a just from a creator's perspective let's call it is the fact that they all have the need that you can logically express your intention and that intention can be something that is it, it can that intention can sit anywhere you know it can it can be yeah but you need to be able to logically express that intention and for the artist it's it's to logically ex, logically express that intention in its purpose in its in, in its it, as an experience what it, what what it's supposed to achieve as an experience for the scientist i i assume that the 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 you need to be able to logically express the intention in its function. Yeah. 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 And, and I think they, there's a lot in common there. Yeah. I think, I mean, also, cause I've, I, I've, I've worked, I've met you, Liam, um, around the same time I met Stefania and where COVID hit. Right. Um, and this idea of us humans are starting to socially move differently, uh, because of, you know social distancing and you know afraid of yep. you know covid but the way that distributed systems you could think of us as essentially a distributed system each yeah. one of us is an orb each one of us is a is an origami little solar sail that is yeah. trying to navigate um in space and so then what we're as as an architect you guys are looking at the art or the actual thing as an architect i would look at the at how the space can 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 change or can um can be designed in order for we for us humans moving in that way yeah um I'm, I'm excited. yeah no absolutely i mean i i was i was i had other things that i was going to show that but i just uh, time wise uh, if 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 people have um at one of the ways that that the, one of the projects actually that's that i feel is quite connected to some of the ideas that we're discussing is actually a very early project called glowing pathfinder bugs which was essentially a, a projection of virtual creatures into a sand pit but the point was that actually i'm sorry this might feel like an aside now but it's the the, the point was that it was actually the relationships between people within that space working on the sand pit in response to the, the virtual creatures projected it was kind of simultaneously architecture media and and a sort of and an artwork at the same time so it's 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 that sort of yeah i'm i'm, I'm probably a bit off topic there but it, it's the <laughs> idea it's it's the end of it's the end of it's friday afternoon friday evening um but I, it, I do have a one question for stefania about the fabrication because i for the life of me don't understand okay so we're assuming we're going to space right and there is this radiation and you are looking at in your origami command what understand you're fabricating these hinges and from what i also understand is that the whole point is the solar sails would deploy and open and they don't change your, their configuration what you're trying to do is to change that configuration 
Um, and granted that what I was saying is that in architecture are there's gravity and there's you know friction and other things that are happening so the wear and tear happens with those hinges but how do you what is the what is the material that can handle the wear and tear of opening and closing and radiation and just you know being in space <laughs> So oh, yeah, that's uh, that's okay. So uh, let's start with the with the with the fact that also in space there is uh, the effect of gravity. It's just less strong <laughs> than what we 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 feel uh, here. Um, so not only gravity, but an amount of forces in the solar system that included the, the sun radiations. Just only this, like the 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 sun ray eating a surface as an effect on a spacecraft, just because we are in microgravity. So th that's effect are quite, it's something that happens also on ground, but we don't see object moving because they are illuminated by the sun, uh, simply because the gravity here is stronger. But all these micro forces allows you to do stuff in space. Uh, usually we don't like them and we have propulsion system to try to force the spacecraft go in the direction we want because all those noises, forces, for us is a disturbance. Like if you think about solar, sa um, sorry, a sailing boat, they use wind to be, uh, to be pushed around. Now, the idea is to say here in this project is to use a perturbation to achieve something. So kind of enhancing those effects uh, and try to be able to use it all for propulsion or for reconfiguration. So in, in terms of materials, uh, the sail is made of this, um, I don't know if you saw the first picture, but it is kind of a cap, is, is captain. And captain is usually uh, used, uh, is a, it's called like a spacecraft blanket. Sometimes spacecraft are, are wrapped in this material because it protects them from radiation. So the sail itself is actually made of this material. Um, and uh, the, 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 the side in which we want to announce the effect of side radiation we may, we, is aluminized. So it's also almost like it behaves like a mirror. And the idea which um, we haven't explored the actuation here much, the, uh, how to change optical properties, but what you can do, uh, there are some, you can apply on each facet um, what they called, um, um, how can I say, polymer dispersed liquid crystals. So when you turn them on and off, they orient in a way that uh, if they are off, the, the sail is opaque, I think. When you turn them on, they let the light pass through. So if you turn on and off on, on each facet a different time, then you will have displacement forces. And then that's what you could use to trigger the reconfiguration. So if you think about a, a, like the classical a cube origami, like you might turn the first facet on and then the second facet, and then we'll trigger configuration. So I hope this give kind of an idea of how, how it works. But this is, will require a combination of uh, also, what orientation control, which is probably what Liam was saying, like when when we activate one facet, the center of mass of the system is changing. So probably we need to reorient it towards the sunlight. So when, if you imagine one facet you fold, now I need to reorient it to fold the other one. So it's going to be kind of an interesting uh, rubric cube. <laughs> try to fold it <laughs> yeah no i was i was going to say that that to me that it's one of the problems that you've got is that actually the subtlety of the the subtlety of the folding is that as you get to these kind of micro systems the 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 subtlety in and the variables are so minuscule that actually tiny little effects just you know kinking in the material or or are going to have quite quite large effects which are then are then um, exponentially multiplied because the system is exactly. is one that's exactly so that was the initial idea that's why that now we think that we will need probably an hybrid system like optical property and the 4d material so maybe a combination on those two will allow to lock things things into place as well mm -hmm. do you but, yeah. do you think there's any mileage in just 
doing an experiment which is not about the solar sail, but is just about an object that you take into space that has lots and lots of different ways it can unfold. That's what I, when I was saying earlier about yep. just an experiment, an experimental box, actually put kind of like an art project, because this is what <laughs> arts does really. It's just kind of like, we'd like it to do, we'd like it just to unfold in certain ways. Let's just do that. We'll fly something up and all its, its only job is just to try an experiment with all the ways things it can unfold just to see, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I think the cheapest way for now is to do in the lab. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah true. I will. I, I will love to try in space, but I think uh, there are a lot of uh, opportunity. I think for uh, for trying like prototype prototype in space and this with CubeSat. That's why the project is about using CubeSat to do that because in the in the I don't know maybe maximum in the next 10 years I hope to have the opportunity to test it into space and have okay. something that works that would be so so cool but uh, yeah <laughs> that, that, just uh yeah, yeah. that that's what, what I will uh, in my dream if you want <laughs> yeah sure let's, we'll get let's, there. let's let's yeah yeah I'd, I'd quite like to talk outside of this conversation because I've got some thoughts <laughs> sure I've, it's good yeah, yeah yeah no i've got some thoughts i just yeah <laughs> yeah good. cool yeah. okay are we done yes, yes. I think we can yeah. have the discussion we can, we can talk for hours i'm sure yeah no i'm I, you know me <laughs> yes yeah this was this was great and absolutely amazing um so and i'm sad that i'm coming to an end <laughs> i think i'm just gonna just put my face right on, on top of the microphone um and unfortunately this is our last session for the year and we're gonna come back um after a summer break because we all just after covid and all that need a summer break and i'm just changing the youtube thing <laughs> um anyway so what we're going what what i'm trying to say right now uh, is that it's but after september after we, st we come back, hopefully the MSC will start. Uh, for the last five sessions, you have seen our moderators who will be teaching on the MSC and the people that are in our network that hopefully will be willing to come and share their knowledge with our students. Um, are, please come to our website to check out the, the previous uh, recordings. And to be honest i'm pretty i'm i'm pretty happy that this was like the grand finale it is a really cool session <laughs> i am geeking out completely um but um and thank you to anna for moderating in an amazing session and thank to you. liam and stefania for giving us some of their time they've been generous and they've been creative and very exciting um thank you for inviting us <laughs> thank you for inviting thank us you. definitely yes um, Lydia is one of what is in our session and she is sending it to us, but she is, she says that the session was inspiring and thank you to everybody. Um, and I guess we're going to close out the session. Cool. Have cool. a great summer, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, you too. Thank you. And a good weekend. And a good weekend. Yeah. That, that first. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. Thank everybody. You. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. I'm just ending the the YouTube session.